Welcome back to another episode of Rhetoric, lifestyle show dedicated to the emerging artists, giving business and creative insight within the artistry of food, fashion, and music. I'm your host, Vinyl P. Art, and today we're in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, meeting with the multifaceted chef and educator, Del Glover of Del Glover Catering and Events. With every ingredient responsible in defining this young talent is the same amount that he applies with changing the paradigm of how we see food today. Behind the creation of his nostalgic dishes is a man that set out to change the world one bite at a time. But this was no easy beginning. It's a segment you don't want to miss. You're watching Rhetoric. Food is this cultural element that plays a pivotal instrument in the Institute of Society. One of the uh, few arts that has influenced and remained as a focus point of some of our uh, political views, such as race, geography, just economics, faith, you know, but at a, as an adolescent, mm -hmm. I'm sure it wasn't viewed in this magnitude. For me, it was, you gotta eat, right? It wasn't about anything else besides survival. I'm sure it, it brought unity within the household as well. And you know, this household um, you grew up in, small section of Westchester, yeah. Mont Kisco. Yeah. <laughs> For someone that has never visited Mont Kisco, how would you describe it? What was the community like? Um, my family, all of us pretty much lived in a line um, between uh, a certain diameter. So it was like my house, my grandmother's house, aunts, uncles, cousins, and then same thing down the block. And then my stepfather's family across the street. So it was it was where we were all familiar with each other. Um, it was it was incredible. I mean, growing up, you know, between lower class and middle class, you know, a son of a mother who worked her adult career life as a factory worker. Yeah. You know, a stepfather who's also a blue collar worker. Yep. You know, um, so for both, clearly there was a living that needed to be made. Of course. You know, so how did that occasional like absence uh, allow you to claim your independence and just your curiosity around the kitchen? It was very um, unintentional. Like I had the mom who was like, you know, she'd give you the phone call in the middle of the day, take the chicken out. Like, don't forget to take the chicken out and defrost the chicken. Like, and then she wouldn't tell me what to do with it. Right? So I would have to figure out, okay, so once the chicken is defrosted, how are we gonna eat this? Right? <laughs> so I had to, I had to, I had to feel my way around and like just take bits and pieces from what I've seen her do. So like, that was my first introduction to like preparing meals. So expecting that it wasn't abundance of food mm -hmm. and limited options to choose from growing up in a household of six. Yeah. And exposure only goes as far as what your parents are able to provide. True. So what made that first dish so special? Um, I think using my creativity, I think tapping into that creative side and, and realizing that what you have, you can create something good. I think the first thing that I actually made like from scratch, like outside of like anything box was like roasted potatoes. <laughs> and like, it was funny, the, like, like the method that I used was very unconventional. It was like 
potatoes in a bag, butter, spices, seasonings, and I'm in the kitchen like shaking it up. And my mom was like, what are you doing? And I'm just like, oh. And like I pop it in the oven and it comes out. It like got this beautiful brown color and like they're eating and they're like, yo, like you gotta make these all the time. And like that, I, I think that was when I was like, you're doing something right. Like you figured this out. Now, from this point, did you see this as being a future profession or still at this time you were experimenting with the ideal of this just being a hobby? Yeah, this was definitely not something that I thought I would be doing as a career. But the idea of me uh, doing this as a profession was, was very uh, far, far from my mind. Now, amidst this hobby, you had a love for another form of art, mm -hmm. which was uh, music. Yes. <laughs> Singing since the age of 12. Yeah in a church that was literally just feet away from your bedroom. Yep. <laughs> With that, you developed uh, songwriting at the age of 21. Yeah. So it's like now you're equipped to like take on the world. Yeah. You decide to um, exit Mount mm -hmm. to pursue this to pursue this dream. Yeah. You uh, move to the Bronx, still close enough to be comfort from family if you if you needed to. Yeah. But um, you move. And um, you connect with uh, your former partner, uh, William Isaac Hart. Yep. You guys form a musical group. Yeah. Uh, DGI Music. Yep. A partnership. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at this time, like, what did you want to happen in your life going down this musical journey? I think in that moment, uh, the one word that comes to mind was success. Like, you, you are in your 20s now, and like, people around you are making moves and they're doing things and you need to jump on this bandwagon. Pursuing this with him was, at the time, my way of putting my seal on, like this is what you're good at, this is what you're able to do, this is this is what brings you joy, this is what, and it, and it, and it keeps you two together, so like, why not? Now, what do you think it meant to, to Isaac? I think he used it as a way to express himself because he was also an artist in his own right, you know, he sang as well. He also grew up in church, and I think it was a way for him to stay connected to that part of him. You know, now you guys are at a point of, you know, networking, from the outside, you know, these things are looking promising. Of course. But was it, you know, what was the reality of it all? So we created what we felt other people needed. And it was a, a network of people to bring out the inner artist in another person. So like somebody who has this same dream, the same goal to want to pursue music, um, but not really sure where to, where to go, where to start with it. We were that foundation, like, we booked rehearsals and we did like songwriting seminars with each other and like it was it was a it was a good thing that we had going but um, it takes a lot of time it's a lot of time it takes out of you um, your own money right it's like the financial strain was not something that we kind of thought about but like when we we're booking these like rehearsal spaces that's come out of our pocket and mind you you know i'm in education still at the time so i'm not you know fully equipped financially to come out of pocket for these things so that was so i think the the vision wasn't thoroughly or um flushed out completely. It was just something that we knew that we wanted to do for ourselves and other people. So it was just easy to to go ahead and like do that, but the background, the 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 legwork was a, it was a lot. Clearly this was a passion, you know. Yeah. But why leave this dream? Why scrap it? I mean, what was the reality? Uh so for me it was the realization that there's so many other people out here chasing this same dream. Um, everywhere we went, I, I think that was for me personally as a as someone who wanted to pursue this for himself, right? Because even though I'm, even though we have this this company or this this idea to do this for other people, I'm still in the background. Like, well, what am I gonna do? Like, where's where's gonna where's my shine gonna come from, right? Um, how am I gonna benefit from this? At the end of the day, I'm pouring into someone else, someone else's dream, but it's like. Where's my opportunity gonna come for me to also do the same thing for myself? And so when I started to think about um, the many people around me that also wanted to pursue music as their career, it was just like, you know, you go to auditions and you don't get the audition and somebody you know gets the audition and it's, it's very discouraging. Do you think that um, it was a good attitude to like have at that time just you know, being discouraged because so many others are chasing this dream. No. You know, because, you know, the reality, I mean, 
you know, you're quite different from the next man, you know? So, I mean, what would you say to, I guess, someone that's a mere reflection of yourself? Yeah. Like, what advice would you give them knowing that, you know, someone is trying to pursue this, this, this musical journey? Uh, so first and foremost, it was definitely not a good attitude to, to have. Um, I think at the time I lacked uh, the confidence in myself to say, I'm singing this song, or I'm doing this, whatever. He may be or she may be doing the same thing, but my delivery is gonna be different or my appearance is gonna be different. Like I didn't, at the time, I didn't have the, 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 the discipline to uh, separate myself from anybody else. I, I, I put myself in the same box. So my advice would be to recognize the art within yourself and know that it's not gonna be like anybody else's and that's fine because there's somebody that's gonna hear, see, and they're gonna, they're gonna interpret what you do differently and they're gonna love what you do. You know, so after this musical journey, you um, embarked on a lot of different type of work. I mean, from computer aid design to uh, stylist at J. Crew to um, Home Depot. I mean, it just seemed like work, no true heart behind it. Yeah. Mentally, where were you at knowing that you know, what you envisioned for your life didn't turn out as you planned. Yeah, um, I was in a space of disappointment. Um, a lot of people around me had figured out their paths and like people my age, they were already like doing things that they, you know, loved. And I was in a space where I hadn't figured that out yet. So I was going through these different stages in my life trying to find my area. So yeah, I, I did all these things, but in the end though, it actually helped because I was able to find the area in which I am today. So I don't regret those. That time, I actually appreciate it because now I'm, I'm able to say like, I've gotten to a place where I know that what I'm doing is contributing to the world. Right. Yeah. You know, it's funny how, you know, life has a way of kind of revisiting the past. Yeah. You know, it's funny how things just kind of resurface. Oh yeah. And for you, you know, that past, past was uh, cooking. Yeah. You know, so, um, you decided to enroll into culinary art school, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I, I, you know, I got you here because um, this has been this long debate about culinary school. Yeah. If it's truly needed to be successful, yeah. so you see chefs like uh, Gordon Ramsay, yeah. you see Rachel Ray, mm -hmm. you see um, Tom Colicchio. Yep. Uh, all of these chefs really didn't go through the tr traditional. Uh, way of, you know, as far as schooling, you know, um, but yet they are successful. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, with this, you know, people say like culinary school is a good investment if you're like a trust fund baby or if you have someone like forking out the bill. Right. But in all reality, you know, culinary school can leave you in massive debt. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, two-year degree mm -hmm. can run you from 35,000 to 55,000, yeah. you know, and then for a four-year, it can range up to 110,000. Oh, yeah. And then if you're just going just for a certificate, mm -hmm. that can cost you 20,000, yep. you know? Now, granted, I know that there's some pros, you know, considering, you know, insurance has to be high when you're dealing with future chef, when sh you're dealing with future chefs and they're, using knives and there's fire oh, yeah. so yeah i can understand oh, yeah. like insurance being you know being high and also just the pro of um you know culinary school can leave you down many avenues yeah. you know from you know, r d to you know food styling to mm -hmm. publishing to media and not to mention if you become an alumni it can better your chances of networking of course and you know it's also a tight community it's also a tight community it is you know yeah. the food industry is a is a very tight community absolutely you know but you know here's where the the negative connotation comes in mm -hmm. you know people feel like um you know culinary school is it's high it's a high operational course you know but it's um very vocational level of teaching. Absolutely. You know, and the reason for that is because, you know, they don't want a, uh, they want to keep a low dropout rate, mm -hmm. you know, or, and as well as a placement rate, mm -hmm. you know, so they uh, make school accessible to even just to the average student. Of course. You know, and not to mention when you get out of, 
you know, culinary school and you finally get into the field and you decide to work in a kitchen, you know, uh, line cook, I mean, at a fancy restaurant, at a high end restaurant, yeah. they make about 18 an hour and that's at a high end. But you think about it, that's not uh, equivalent or profitable for you to even get out of debt. No. You know, <laughs> so. I mean, where do you where do you stand with this information? I think I, I got to take you back to just where or how I became interested in even going to culinary school. I think um, for me, it was about the credibility that it gives you. And I think my main focus was with this certificate behind you, um, it'll give you some sort of clout, right? It'll give you, you know, that's a great conversation starter, right? Oh yeah, I'm in culinary school and like people, people, people gravitate to that, right? That's how the conversation starts. And um, that was my, that was my main focus. I was just like, I feel like I just need to go to better educate myself because even as a, you know, as a young cook and somebody who's just breaking into the industry, there are still a lot of things that I did not know. So I felt like going to culinary school was something that was, was something that was gonna give me the just the background of like what it means to be a chef, right? Um, wrong, <laughs> very wrong. <laughs> um, I think my takeaway from spending 13 months in the culinary program was I learned two fancy words, uh, garmage and mise en place, and it's like <laughs> those are fancy words to say prep and you know. Um, like another word for like help like you're like the person who prepares things and you have this area set and like you're good and it's like i could have all the things that i learned or went through during the 13 months i was a part of this program i, I could have watched a youtube video if you want to break into this industry you're gonna have to make your own way you're gonna have to figure this out on your own you're gonna have to yeah absolutely i learned some things but I'm just not that type of learner. Like, so I got into the kitchen and I'm like, okay, this is how you use this utensil. This is how you use this knife. This is how you create this dish. And it was just, it was just hands-on experience that I gave myself that I realized I had to do this on my own because spending 13 months in this program didn't do it for me. So do I regret it? No, not fully. But as I said, these are, these were things that I could have, that I could have learned from anybody you know, who, who was familiar with these things and I did not need to enroll or become a part of this program just to be able to call myself a chef. Now, you know, after your time in culinary school, I well noticed that you didn't take the traditional route of working in a restaurant. No. You know, why is that? I had other plans for myself. Once I, once I was able to realize and, and figure out that cooking was something that brought me to a place where, you know, that I had never been, right? Um, preparing meals for people is, is something that I saw, you know, my family do. And, you know, when we got together, it was just like the experience that we went through when we ate something that tasted good. I said, this is what I want to do for people. This is something that I can offer people. And I think, you know, uh, food is one of those industries that is never going to die. If you have what it takes to prepare something so good that people are like talking about it days later, um, sending you messages and saying like, I can't forget about when you made X, Y, Z. Like that's what I feed off of. I'm feeding off of that. I can do that in a restaurant, but nine out of 10 times I'm following the recipe of someone else. I'm following the technique of someone else and my heart is not going into that food. This is something that was pre-designed, pre-planned by somebody else, and I'm just, uh, I'm just a worker at that point. I don't want to be a worker. I want to be a creator. Clearly, you know, you being a creator, you um, started out with uh, this venture with, once again, uh, William Isaac Hart. Yeah. You know, um, you guys formed a, a catering mm -hmm. company that was dedicated to uh, comfort food and, yep. and meal prepping. Mm -hmm. uh, little kitchen, big appetite. Yes. <laughs> What was the um, inspiration behind that? Oh, well, the name, I think the name speaks for itself, Little <laughs> Kitchen, Big Appetite. So um, we, we lived in this very, uh, probably it was about 345 square foot studio, um, two grown men. Like you spun around, we were outside in the hallway. You know, it was, it was very tiny and it was structured um, in a way that you would not think the way we cooked that the food came out of this. Um, it was a two burner electric cooktop that we had, no oven um, and a microwave. And like we, we used that 
to the best of our ability and we were able to realize that we had, you know, outside of our love for music, we were both foodies. We would cook something, throw it on Instagram and people would respond and they'd be like, where are you guys at right now? And we'd be like, oh, we in the house. Like, <laughs> you know, we home. And they were like, yo, that looks so good. And it's like, okay. And we had fun doing it. So we were like, again, thinking of ways to be successful and capitalize on ideas, right? I'm still in that mindset. And we're like, we could do something with this. Like, we're a couple. Um, this is a way for us to stay connected. Let's show other people how to do this too. Let's, let's take this out into the world and show people like, you guys get into a fight, go in the kitchen, cook together. That is something that you can do together that will bring you closer. You know, with this being your first go around, you guys were pretty uh, successful. I mean, cooking internationally, you know, uh, Africa, Dubai, um, you know, Abu Dhabi, you know, meeting with senators and community leaders, you know, now officially being hands-on in the field. You know, what were some of the um, challenges that came with building this venture? First and foremost, um, I began to lose sight of the actual relationship that we, that we have with each other, right, outside of the business that we were together. And I think I began to um, lose sight of that once everything started taking off. And on top of that, we limited resources. Um, working out of such a small workspace, um, not being able to mass produce, you know, the way we probably could have if we had, um, and like who's to say that we weren't on the way to that, um, and that couldn't have happened, but um, it was a lot of, it was a lot of uh, leg work and, you know, we didn't have a vehicle, so we're, you know, Finding the best means, I think there was one event that we did, and we were on like the New York, the New Jersey Transit, and it was like the worst experience. And I, I was like, I don't even care if I make it to this event right now. And this is it for me. Like I'm, I'm stressed. I'm hot. This stuff is heavy. Food is heavy, right? So like, so like little things like that just like put me in a in a space where I was just like, do we really have what it takes to do this? And again, it was it was one of those things that you know not being confident in the process. Of, of things and uh, I kind of I kind of lost sight of that. Now there's just one. Yeah. You um, now decided to do your own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, Dell Glover catering events. That's it. Um, what's some of the hardship now that you go through working single-handedly to just build your company from from ground up? So I think uh, you know I put my foot in my mouth you know, <laughs> a little bit, but it's on me now, right? So I have to create the menu, I have to create the schedule for myself, you know, trying to balance that and also teaching at the same time. It, 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 it gets to be a lot, but um, the satisfaction is there. The, the, the love is there, the passion is there. Like everything, I've taken everything that I've learned up until this point and I'm, and I'm putting it into everything that I do now. Um, just pieces of my childhood pieces of, you know, a uh, little kid's a big appetite, like taking everything that I've learned, taking pieces of, you know, my culinary program, like all those things and kind of like bottling them up and like pouring out a little bit at a time. I just take pride in what I do and I, and I see the value in it, but it's a lot of work. It is definitely a lot of work, but it's work that I don't mind. Even with these, uh, you know, accomplishments, you know, just the, this beginning stage, you know, for you. Yeah. Um, you know, there's another talent that lies, you know, within you. Mm -hmm. You teach ninth grade, yes. <laughs> ELA, uh -huh. in a charter school in the South Bronx. Yes. And you teach culinary school as well in inside the school. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how did you luck up and how were you able to like infuse the two of the two things that you love the most, just, you know, education and cooking? A friend of mine sent me a link one day. I was, you know, in between jobs, and a friend of mine sent me a link to this like info session for this school that had just, you know, started. We're in like our two and a half year mark, so we're fairly fresh. Um, and I went to the info session and I uh, talked to some of the people that already were employed there, and just the way that they spoke about their job. Um, I remember thinking like I want to I want to talk about my job like this. I want to I want to work in a place where I can talk about it in this way. Um, 
and then I, I did like a school visit. I went to, you know, see like how the structure was. And at the time they were in another building, they were sharing a building with another school. Um, but I went and it was just the, the very unconventional way of teaching, right? Um, I applied and I got the call during the summer. And, um, but before that I had known that they allow you to bring in things that you're passionate about and incorporate them into the curriculum. And when I found that out, and this is at the peak of my culinary, you know, um, discovery, like realizing that I wanted to cook and like cooking is something that I, you know, love to do. Um, in my interview, when I, when I mentioned that, like the room lit up and it was just like, we've been looking for you. Where have you been this whole time? And like, when I, when I discovered that I was going to be able to do that, I said, sign me up. What's some of like just the cultural shock or like the unawareness that, you know, dealing with these, these students, mm -hmm. you know, now they're now awoken to having this, uh, you know, culinary class. Yeah. Like what are some of the things that you've seen in them now that has become like a major shock to you? So one thing that I've realized in teaching is you have to connect with students in some way, right? You have to be able to identify with them on some level. So realizing that cooking is something that one, none of them do at home. It's just really incredible to see um, the, the many things that they're unfamiliar with, just the unfamiliarity of different foods that I prepare with them. It's also mind blowing at the same time that you are not aware that there are a hundred and some thousand different you know, species of cheese out there, right? It's not just about American cheese, you know that, right? So like um, being able to expose them to those things is, is really great. I get that sense of they need me for this. I'm the one who's in, who's responsible for 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 this portion of their learning, right? And it just brings me so much joy. Now, you know, these kids, they look up to you as a leader, yeah. you know, and I see, you know, what you do as far as within the community, mm -hmm. you know, uh, working with Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and just kids from the South Bronx mm -hmm. um, with these uh, food events for the homeless. Yeah. Now, you remind me of like, the male version of like Karen Washington. Oh wow! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now you know Karen Washington. You know uh, transplant, mm -hmm. moved to uh, the South Bronx yeah. in uh, the late '80s, mm -hmm. mid '80s. Uh, dedicated uh, a lot of her life to um, agriculture yeah. and just urban farming. Yep. Um, she she also you know she she made her way up and like she made it to the White House. You know when Obama was in office and yeah she kind of created that lane for like, you know, food justice. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, not to mention just a chairman of the Botanical Gardens right. and just um, founding a lot of um, the uh, farmer markets that you see within these uh, inner cities. Yeah. Now, you know, you haven't reached those accolades just yet. Not yet. But you guys share the same common goal for uh, food justice. Absolutely. You know, how do you feel with um, just within the inner cities, just these uh, urban communities and just the, uh, the injustice that happens with our food system. It's really upsetting to see, um, specifically speaking, you know, from the perspective of, you know, living and working in the South Bronx, my students live, um, you know, they live and go to school there. Also, it's, it's upsetting to see the options that, is, that are to their avail, right, as far as food. Um, we don't always want a Popeyes, you know, why, why can't we get a Chipotle on the Grand Concourse, right? Why can't we get a chopped salad bar on, you know, Fordham Road? It's like, why are we not available to these different, you know, ways of eating? Um, you know, I go to the grocery store like when I'm shopping for an event or just buying things from my own refrigerator and I, you know, I see the, the things that are people, you know, that people are buying. You know, these are low income families who, you know, may have more than one child to take care of and like the things that are in their car, there's a lot of like processed food. It's heartbreaking that we are subjected to these types of, you know, options. What is your take on just the phrase, you know, food desert? Um, I relate to that. So I think, I think for me, being able to expose that side of things and say like, it's, it's okay for you to, 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 to go a little further or 
request that a market that you frequent, you know, has fresh vegetables and things that are not outdated, right? I, because I, because I find that shopping in my neighborhood, I don't have access to a certain ingredient, and I'm just like. You know, I'm always on social media and my story on, you know, on, on um, IG and I'm complaining. I'm like, why am I coming to this place and the, the, the cilantro looks wilted? And I'm like, do people not eat this in the hood? Like, <laughs> what, like, like what's up with that? And then, you know, I have to realize and I kind of answer my own question. And I'm like, no. What do you think has to happen, you know, for people that have that mindset of wanting to put better food in them? Um, one, I think it has to be desired, and I think it's about educating yourself. You need to actually know um, the value of the things that you're that you're eating. Um, I'm sure people eat, you know, garlic, but people don't know that black garlic is, you know, way better, or the russet potato uh, as opposed to the purple one. Like these these same same things that you're using. Um, step out step outside of that don't stay within that area that's gonna limit you from being able to eat the same things that you love, but just in a, in a better way. Just hearing you and just seeing your passion just makes me have so much of a, a greater respect you. for you. You know, you're this man that's on a quest to just yeah. make change. Absolutely. You know, and um, you know, with that, I guess, you know, throughout this, this journey of yours of building your establishment, Dell Glover Catering Events, yeah. you know, working with children, yeah. you know, and just trying to improve within the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess the question I, I'm, I'm asking you is, you know, what do you want people to remember you for when it's all said and done? So my, my pastor of the church that I attend, he said something one Sunday that I've been holding on to. And um, it's probably something that I've heard before, but uh, he, he gave the message that the gifts that you possess are not for you, right? So the gift of cooking and creating and uh, feeding people isn't for me. This is something that I need to do for someone else, for other people, um, adolescents in particular, but people nonetheless. Like this is something that you cannot hone, you know, you cannot harbor this. Like you have to expose this and get this out there to people because yeah, you know about Rachel Ray, you know about Gordon Ramsay, you know, but nobody knows Dell. Like people, people are gonna know who Dell is. Say no more, Dell. Thanks, man. Appreciate you, brother. I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you. Every tragic moment in my life, the emotion of fear, the emotion of acceptance, the emotion of, am I gonna be that great at this? I just channel so many emotions and so much trauma. How much can I take? How much can one person take? We would love to have a meeting with you to represent you. I'm going to be challenged. This is my name, Karan. I was released from the project. Karan, again, we do not have room on the roster for you. I never got picked to even showcase my talents. I would be respected and appreciated and valued as an artist. If you are not a star, you will not be picked. As I stand here as a 30 year old man, this is his passion, this is what he's destined to do, this is his purpose in life, like this is him. And this is what he's gonna manifest in his life. I wanna be able to feel okay. I wanna be able to feel worthy because there's so many times I've battled with just being Quran because I've struggled so much through the years and suppressed so much through the years of just being Quran and really understanding and internalizing and living in its fullest truth of exactly who Quran is. Everybody is not going to understand. really was in a complete shock like what happened just now each and every time that I perform each and every time that I dance I feel those same overwhelming emotions
So many different emotions circulating through my body. Another blow to my face, and I remember literally just blood leaking from my face onto my body. With no judgment, no critique, with none of that. I was literally able to be myself 100,000% because of my mother. I remember it's been times when my father would literally hand me city job applications. And I would literally hand them back to him like, Pops, you know this is not me. Well, the only thing that I want my father to ever look at me as is a man. Take the gay shit away. Take the dancer away. Take the emotional person away. Just look at me as a man. My purpose and passion in that in life before me has this charm, has this personality, has this genius and warm heart, has this affectionate feel, have this impactful purpose. We got into a physical altercation, and from there, I remember being locked up. Let me attack this little nigga because he's gay. said to me, he was like, yo fam, you good, you good. So it's troubling, but in the same breath, it's, it's an amazing feeling to know that I hold such power, that I hold such strength, that I hold such independence, that I hold such acceptance. See? Dance is always great for me because despite those things, it lives in me. Nothing can take the passion and the feeling that I receive from dance, and nothing can take that away from me. Every moment in my life, every trauma, every tragic moment in my life, dance has shown me how pivotal it is to my soul. I know I just have to continue to allow myself to be the person that I am and allow myself to be the person that my mother has always made sure I am. That's the legacy that I envision for myself. It's just to always be myself. Zero fucks. Just being cool. Him is powerful. Him is powerful. Him is powerful. He who inspires to manifest that means any and everything. Welcome back. So what you guys thought of Chef Del? Pretty amazing, right? Well, up next is a gentleman by the name of Omar Sergio Mornin. To the world, many of you know him, his brand, Sergio Wonder. A Florida native that moved to New York several years back to pursue his dream. In the process of pursuing his dream, he worked with several powerhouse brands, such as Michael Kors, Diesel, Puma, J. Crew, and currently Tommy Hilfiger. Get to know the man that's striving to take his urban minimalist brand to the next level. It's a segment you don't want to miss. You're watching Rhetoric. So being a Florida native, mm -hmm. I assume that the uh, origin of the birthplace kind of sparked the uh, curiosity, the interest, the love to become a fashion designer. For sure. But, you know, something tells me that um, the hunger, it wasn't as fulfilling and it seems as if you wanted more. You know, going to school in Florida, American Inter Intercontinental University, and um, leaving the Florida campus to study abroad at the London campus, mm -hmm. I'm sure it did a lot for you. What was London like, and how did it change your whole perspective on fashion? London was pretty amazing, mainly because it was definitely a culture shock. I think the, one of the most important things that I learned there was just the liberation in each period. So you, you very much get a sense of what the actual city was from the very beginning. Um, and of course, the teachers had a whole 
different approach to how they, ta they taught. And then I met one of the most important teachers I ever had, really, which was Michael Azu, uh, who has his own brand as well, which not many of my teachers in Florida had. They were just had, you know, teaching fashion. He was the only one who had his own brand, and he was teaching for the sake of teaching. No, it definitely seems like London played a major part in, in, in your life and kind of making that step towards becoming the man that you are now. Let me ask you, do you feel as if an uh, inspiring designer can stay within a small city or a state or country for, for, that, for that matter with, and flourish? Or do you feel like they have to come to uh, a larger city with more influence? I definitely think it helps to come to a larger city because if you're in a smaller city or a smaller town, you kind of have an idea of what fashion is and whatever that idea is, whether you're looking at it through fashion publications like, of course, you know, Vogue, um, Cosmopolitan, whatever that might be, or GQ. You have to be in the actual monster for you to actually understand how it works, who the people are. Um, it's just helpful. There, it, you're not really going to get much of a successful uh, result. I don't think if you're not where it is, whether it be New York, whether it be London, Milan, Paris, wherever it may be. And I think that's mainly why I wanted to get away. I think when I decided to go to London, I had already been to New York for a while, mainly because I got this opportunity with Team People magazine. I won this um, competition with uh, DNL at the time. Um, and you know they flew me out there so I kind of already had an experience with New York so I wasn't ready to come back just yet. You making the decision to leave it seems uh, like it was I mean truly beneficial and now like you yeah. know going to London now living in New York you um, was able to really work for a lot of uh, different companies a lot of powerhouse brands. One of my favorites had to have been J. Crew. Seeing Jenna Lyons, who was the creative director at the time, and of course she has like this whole ambiance of her own, and she, you know, she would come in with sequin pants and these giant glasses. You couldn't really help but to just watch how she did things. She's just amazing. And of course, working with Tommy Hilfiger, of course, that's a whole other situation on his own because he's, uh, he's an American icon within himself and just having all the people who he's worked with, Snoop Dogg, Usher, Aaliyah, uh, Q-Tip, you know, he's, he's helped shape where American fashion is today with the sense of just how, it, how he played a role in hip hop as well. Yeah, I mean, it's impressive, you know, for you to be the age that you're at and, you know, being in New York for like 11 years, you know, and to have like this experience and just able to just grasp onto this, this knowledge you know, what was like some of the do's and don'ts you, was, you would say that uh, allowed you to better your craft and help you build your brand to, to a more larger plateau? Ooh, one of the don'ts when I actually learned is if you see something that's already on the market, don't do it. Um, it'll always be burned in my brain because you're basically kind of doing things that are already available, so why kind of like contribute to something that's already there? As far as the do's go, I think as long as you identify what your, your niche is and what's special about you and your brand and your aesthetic and how you design, I think you just always have to push at it and continuously make sure that people know what it is that's special about you aside from what's already available on the market. Now, I wanted to go back to uh, Tommy Hilfiger. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a discussion yeah. uh, before, and you were telling me that a good portion of the staff at Tommy are not aware that you design. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that, like, how does that happen? Like, I mean, why so secretive on, you know, sharing past or future endeavors of Sergio Wonder? So, what I do for Tommy Hilfiger is, um, I'm the associate showrooms manager, so I oversee 12 of the showrooms that we have here in New York. I do navigate myself throughout the building a lot and of course if word spreads amongst 500 employees it'll just become a thing and I don't want it to become a thing even though one of my dreams really was to become the black Mark Jacobs <laughs> and you know how he had you know he was he was the creative director for Louis Vuitton and had his own thing with Mark Jacobs um, so 
I'm kind of living what that dream is now, but also I just think it's almost like I don't want them to think there's dual loyalty. At any time you ever think to yourself, give myself the opportunity to dedicate myself more to my craft and my brand? Absolutely, I think about it all the time, the mo like the moment when I'm actually gonna have to not devote so much energy to someone else's vision. But the only thing that's always stopping me is always thinking that you're gaining so much knowledge from actually wor working with that monster. And you know, there's so much that I've learned and that I'm continuing to learn. And also there's so many opportunities that this working with other brands has given me. And it's almost like I'm holding on to one really good thing until I'm completely ready. Now, you're also part of a uh, mentorship yeah. for Tommy Hilfiger. I mean, touch on that. I mean, like for someone that's pursuing, you know, um, the fashion industry and want to become a fashion designer, I mean, what's the importance of like having a mentor or just um, surrounding yourself with like seasoned individuals? It's very important to me that you have a mentorship, that I have a mentor because you always want someone who's already been working in that field. They know the mistakes that you're not supposed to make. They can kind of guide you without you having to make those mistakes, especially if money is involved. Um, so I was lucky enough to be a part of the stretch assignment that they called it, um, where I would basically shadow an executive of my choice. And I chose the SVP of Men's Design, Sarah Hand, who is probably the most amazing person I've met following her on a day-to-day -day basis was very eye-opening mainly because she has to jump from collection to collection. The demands that our accounts sometimes have are they're enormous and if she's in the middle of designing a collection it's sometimes kind of like an inconvenience. It just sucks to know that your idea of how you design a collection when you're becoming a designer you you just think you know you design this beautiful piece of body of work and people will buy it. That might be true, but then knowing that you'll have to make some changes and you just have to figure out how you have to deal with it. But it's good to have that mentorship because you kind of have to see it before you actually deal with it when money is involved. Now, NJAL mm -hmm. um, gave you like ultimate praise. Mm -hmm. Let me just say, you know, for people that are not aware of NJAL, it's uh, the acronym for not just a label. Mm -hmm. You know, they, um, I think it's like the holy grail for emerging designers. Also, that's how I found out about you <laughs> um, some years back. They, um, you know, titled, you know, your brand as the next urban wear wow. for, you know, this, this generation. Yeah. What are some of just the inspiration mm -hmm. that um, allowed you to build on Sergio Wonder the brand? Um, I'm heavily influenced by futurism. We've always had like the oversized, you know, sweatshirts. We've always had the oversized jeans, you know, having to think like what that looks like five years from now. So the inspirations are always going to be where we are going forward. Like I always like to push forward, always. Now what's cool because, you know, within your design, you know, you gradually just see just, um, the improvement as far as like the like the technical like aspect of like your design just grow you know like you you know from my knowledge you know the first um, collection that I saw was in uh, 17 2017 and it was I mean you stood on the lines of being a minimalist of course but it was a simple concept utility just wearable individual pieces that can stand out on its own and then it was in uh, spring of 2018 where it seems as if you got a lot of attention because of the uh, denim inspired collection, which had a cool story to it. It was like very informative. That collection was very, very much kind of like, it was pivotal for me mainly because I did all this research on denim in general. And it was interesting to just find out that denim at some point was banned in some places in America. You couldn't really wear it to like the theater, you couldn't wear it out to dinner, you couldn't wear it to school. It was very interesting to just see that, how the progression of denim kind of came about. So now you're 
newer collection, I see that you adopted this uh, flower logo. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've seen a few people, you know, with the flower, you know, with the flower logo. One in particular was a uh, uh, new artist um, from North Carolina, I believe his name is Samo. Uh, and of course, there was other people as well. But um, what's the, what was the inspiration behind the, the, the logo? Honestly, the inspiration behind that started with Devin Tracy because he is an artist who has a very healthy obsession with um, anything floral. So because I love his music also, I kind of just designed this sweatshirt and a couple other tuxedo pants for him. It was just one amazing for me to just see s someone's music that I admired in one of my pieces and then couple years later to now see Samo, who I actually discovered through SoundCloud, just having to have him appreciate my clothing for his, his performance here in New York City. Now, um, you have this new collection, Wild Wonder. Mm -hmm. And out of the collections, it's my favorite. Wild Wonder was also personal to me, mainly because it, it centered, a, it was a story centered around a, um, a guy who can't really be tamed. And the story really just tells more about him moving about in, in his city and figuring out where he belongs. Um, but no matter where he goes, he kind of, he's always just noticed as being just someone that you have to look at. You know, also some other people that, you know, represent the brand, Sergio Wonder, uh, that comes to mind to me is uh, Emil Wilbekin. Mm -hmm. Now, he was the uh, former chief and editor of Vibe magazine, also gay activist. Mm -hmm. uh, another person that comes to mind is a uh, uh, recording artist, Cake the Killer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it seems, you know, with the two, you know, they represent the LGBT community. You know, what does that mean for you having that support? Um, it means a lot, especially coming from Emil and Cakes. Even though Emil, I didn't really, he's not officially a mentor of mine, but I just, I see and I watch him and I see how he deals with other people. And it's inspiring to me that he, it's, it's, it's always out of love. It's always out of, you know, him just making sure that within the LGBT community, we're always lifting each other up positively and making sure that we're always going in the right direction as far as you know, our story and owning our narrative. Now, I mean, what has your experience been like hmm. being part of LGBT community? My experience um, hasn't always been so good, but I don't think I don't think it's always been terrible. Moving from Miami to New York City, I thought it would have been much greater than it was. But also, I just think it was having to find which tribe I belong to and how I could actually achieve why I came to New York City. Um, and it sometimes can be a little tough because some people don't always see what see what your talents are. They don't always see um, that you've come to New York City for a specific reason, me coming for my career. So it can be a little troubling. And yeah, what do you think are some, some of like the other problems within the fashion industry that they can improve on? Um, one of the biggest problems I think is just fast fashion. I think it, it makes it really hard for some of us who are really passionate about design. Um, it, it has a tendency to kind of affect how quickly and how successful we are with each collection. Um, another issue I think is celebrities calling themselves designers. It's not totally bad because on one hand it gives people who are designers, it gives us opportunities to work for them. On the other hand, it's kind of, it kind of just takes away from the whole people going to school and wanting to have a much greater picture for their vision. Now with these, you know, emerging designers, they're moving more independently and you see, you know, a, a lot of these designers using the tool of social media and I guess just becoming more commerce savvy mm -hmm. when selling product. I mean, just you having some, some time in, 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 in fashion now, I mean, what's some advice you would give uh, an emerging designer 
that's looking to promote and push their product. One of the greatest ed pieces of advice I got from Terry Aggins was to cut out the middleman. And she mainly kind of pushed me to kind of like, you know, not show, not present, you know, don't waste your money on like a big presentation because the world is kind of moving in a digital way. So it makes more sense for you to kind of shoot your lookbook digitally and kind of like cut out any middleman that you would have to spend money on. If I were to give advice off of, to, piggy, to piggyback off of that, it would really just be to kind of spend time, whatever money you have to do, if you don't have to outsource, don't outsource. Whatever you can do in-house, you can do in-house because you really don't want to waste any of your resources on things that you can do yourself. Now, I think the big misconception of you know fashion designers and you know you tell me if I'm wrong, but you know people feel like you know fashion designers make this substantial this substantial amount of money, mm -hmm. but a lot of it goes back into the business. Let me touch on it. It's definitely not the case. I think when you're starting out a fashion brand, you at least have to give yourself five years, five plus years, to at least be able to make a profit of what you're making. My business model is a little bit different because everything is more bespoke or made to measure or made to, made to order. So I can only do that for so long until I actually decide to actually partner up with a factory to be able to make the larger quantities for an account. Um, and of course, that's when you start actually making some form of a, a profit because you're actually getting that money from the account prior to it even being sold. Um, I also think it's difficult for people to go into fashion thinking that you're going to make a lot of money within the first two or three collections. So throw that idea out the window if you're listening. Now, Sergio, you seem, you know, educated in the matter now, but I'm sure it wasn't always like that. Mm -mm. You know, what was the beginning like for you, like building your brand and just learning as you go? The hardships were most certainly the marketing strategy that I wasn't sure about. Um, I wasn't really sure w who I wanted to market to. I wasn't really sure like what the whole branding process was going to be like. Um, I was totally against branding at the time, but look where I am now. So, but it's mainly important for people to know, you know, what pieces you're wearing. It seems streetwear has exploded, you know, and it's a huge demand in the market. You know, you see the success of Balenciaga, you see uh, Supreme, you see Off-White, you know, um, you know, all these labels that are heavy on branding and it seems as if it's driving the economy. Mm -hmm. You know, why is that? Why do you think they're having so much success with doing this? I think apart from the zetkeist that's happening as far as just the explosion of branding because with with supreme and with off-white and with balenciaga they're all kind of having the same strategy as far as like how they brand all of their pieces which there's no problem there but i think also the whole styling factor of how stylists promote and how you know, you have the influencers who are a part of the social media craze. You know, that all plays a part in how people are successful with their branding and successful with their clothing. Um, it's not a terrible thing, but it's just annoying because also high fashion has to then alter how they, in, how they include that in their collections as well. And it also sucks because I also think sometimes when you have brands like, for example, Dior, I would have never guessed that Dior would have taken the same model, but they have. So it sucks that you would pay the same price for Dior that you would for Supreme. When it's all said and done, when you make your mark on this world, what do you want people to know Sergio Wonder for? I think people should always know Sergio Wonder for all black all the time. You can take that for whatever you think it should mean, but all black. What do you want them to know the man for? You should know him for being a seed of Malcolm George Smith, who was a very important man in Clarkstown, Jamaica. He 
owned a cement factory which provided for most of the homes and bu uh, businesses of Jamaica. He also provided most of the produce because he had a cane field, he had just a, a large farm and provided a lot for the community. So I always take that with me throughout this whole journey of being an entrepreneur because I know now that that's just something that's in my blood and something that I can never really get away from. What advice would you give um, an aspiring designer, you know, coming up and wanting to, you know, pursue this industry? I mean, what would you tell them? I would definitely tell them what I tell myself 10 times a day, which is protect your wonder. And that is protecting whatever is special about you, whatever it is unique about you. Focus on it and protect it at all costs. And when I say protect, I just mean, you know, don't let anyone who is outside of your vision kind of persuade you to kind of change that about yourself. I'll leave it at that. Sergio, thank you. No problem. <laughs> it's a pleasure. My lady, what do you see when you scowl at these markings on me? Do I descend into a stereotype of a rapper? This depiction of this black face is striving to be accepted in this creative rat race that's called yours. Oh, you don't understand the pain that I have endured to nick the surface of this world to be constantly ignored. That's all you got? I question, can there really be typos in autobiographies when you determine what the audience sees and yet I stand here in disbelief looking for you to validate me? What's creative freedom? When the irony is that they will eventually box you into a category that you would eventually abide by like matrimony. I do. Feel like the desire I had for you burned deeply like the torch that navigated you back to your porch. But I question his home really for me. Or how we throw words around so loosely because of the liberty. It's all just history. And what does it matter when the victorious one is always gravity? When time can slip you like gallivanting through sand dunes and our hands can unlock like a second past noon. So I leave a piece of me with you. Because now, time that I let go. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go! Welcome back to segment three of episode two. So today I'm here at Colorworks, the number one creative hub in Queens. This creative playground has been responsible for providing some stellar work for some of our young, talented New York creators. But today, it's all about getting up close and personal with one of New York premier entertainment lawyers in the industry. Barry Heyman of Heyman Law Group almost seems he was prepped at a young age to follow this career path. Spending over a decade in the industry, Barry has contributed and gave legal advice to some of our favorite artists. And today, you can add yourself to that list. Segment three starts now. You're watching Retori. So Barry, raised 30 minutes outside of New York City, township of Union, New Jersey. Uh, as an adolescent, you found a common interest for music with a uh, fellow classmate that would end up being quite pivotal in your musical journey. How did this classmate contribute to the path that you're walking on now? I would say I was around eight or nine. I was in summer school uh, studying music, studying all different types of instruments. 
there was this kid there playing all these pop songs at the time. I was like, I want to learn what you're doing. And so I said, how did, you know, who do you study with? You have a piano teacher. And he gave me the information. And after a couple of years, I was about 10, and it led me on this path of studying music and piano uh, with his piano teacher and became our piano teacher and became our mentor. And still to this day, he's uh, been a mentor of ours. And he's also uh, pretty notable within the music industry. He's uh, not only, um, you know, working and affiliated with uh, New York University, but he's a leading mu musicologist, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Ferrar. So this is really uh, a pivotal time in my career, you know, career that I didn't even know about at eight years old already. Spending time under our mentorship and playing the piano. By high school, you're now exploring other musical sounds, as well as uh, traveling into New York more frequently. You're uh, spending a lot of time with friends that are heavy into the uh, DJ circuit. Uh, with that, the seed has been planted for new guest genre of music. You are uh, showing appreciation for artists as Tropical Quest, um, Diggable Planets, D-Light. I mean, for someone that wasn't fortunate to live in that era, you know, how would you paint the picture? Like, what was the New York culture like for you in that time? It's kind of segueing between high school at that point and college where I was going to NYU. So I would kind of pick up on, you know, how to navigate the city and, uh, you know, you know, going locally from Limelight, Palladium, the Tunnel, Webster Hall. I mean, it was a great era in terms of it was, it felt more underground than today. I think it was more about the music, maybe less about the bottle service. So dabbling in all that New York has to offer, at a certain point, you start to self-reflect and think about, all right, where is my, what am I doing in these next years as far as career? There were great opportunities. You know, I got into other colleges, but, you know, I figured I couldn't pass up the opportunity to be in Manhattan to study music business. So um, NYU, again, provided the opportunity to, you know, explore internships. So you entered this internship at Mercury. It was between Mercury Records and another company called SBK Records. Went to visit both offices, interviewed, and I think what was most appealing at Mercury was the decor. <laughs> so that was about the extent of uh, what made me choose it. And I really enjoyed uh, learning uh, about the label and about the diversity of the, the roster, the changing climate musically, um, all started to come together. So doing your schooling and working at Mercury, you would have another defining moment and this one would lead you to another label. I just so happened to be commuting to NYU. I'm on the PATH train, which is the subway system between New York and New Jersey, crowded. And I'm there reading and studying. And the professor actually made his own book that he, um, he bound himself. And it had these pastel colors. And I'm going through it. And the woman next to me just like points her finger at the book and says, Professor Reinhold, music history, NYU. I look at her like, yeah, <laughs> like, how did you know? She's like, I actually studied in that program. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm interning at Mercury. I want to get into business affairs. And she's like, I work in business affairs for the parent company, Polygram Records. And I'm like, can I give you my resume? I'd love to intern there. A couple of weeks later, they uh, got a call to intern, uh, to interview to, for this internship in business affairs. You're at Polygram and you're handling mechanical sampling licensing and paying songwriters. You know, handling songwriting and, being, and doing the payout, I mean, it's uh, something that was so personal. You know, when you first was exposed to it, was there like a shock value to see the amount of capital that was being distributed to these uh, songwriters? The royalty part the department's really the the closest one with the check in their hand. I would, you know, be closer to it and could calculate and estimate, you know, what the royalties were being generated. You know, you know I, I just wanted to ensure that the writers and their respective publishers got paid, you know. Now, you know, for people that like are not aware of how royalties work, like, what would you, like, how would you define it? You know, speaking from the record label perspective, at the end of the day, a royalty is typically a revenue share between parties. And I always use this example of um, Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. 
Um, that there's a, her vocals and the music and the production is a uh, a royalty can be generated from that, and a royalty can be generated from the song that's written by Dolly Parton. And uh, you know, there's other royalty streams within the music industry, but you know, the, the most important thing about the record industry or the music industry is that there's two copyrights: the sound recording and the song. And on the sound recording side, you're paying out artist royalties. Whitney Houston is getting paid, or in the estate, you know, is getting paid an artist or a, a royalty for the exploitation of the sound recording. Dolly Parton's getting paid for the exploitation of the composition. But those are the two from a record label perspective. Now, you know, with you know songwriters, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, it's their earnings are pretty much divvied up from the artist royalties. So, you know, let me ask you, do you feel like songwriters have made like financial gains in this industry or is it still a long way to go for them? So it's interesting, you know, coming from a background in the copyright department, we were talking about a polygram, you know, I'm paying the writer. I'm not really paying the writer a polygram, we're actually paying the, sometimes the administrator, Harry Fox Agency, who then pays the publisher, who then pays the writer. But with technology, uh, writers and um, distribute, you know, distributors and whoever the user is at the end of the day and the writer are trying to come together, I think, um, through technology so that the writer can help retain as much of the royalties as possible. So I think, you know, over the last few years there's been good strides for songwriters and I think we'll continue to make it a more efficient marketplace for them. How do you feel about like this new generation and just the way that things are going on with uh, streaming? More recently, and you know, the issue for writing um, from a royalty perspective is that with streaming taking over downloading, which took over for physical distribution, um, is that equitable, what they're getting, what they're receiving? And so, uh, more recently, the, there was a, um, the Music Modernization Act helped to correct that and increase the royalties um, that, are, that songwriters are to receive uh, pretty substantially, you know, 40-something percent. I mean, it started off very low, but it's better than nothing. And what's interesting um, beyond uh, just an increase in royalty is like, can the writer uh, eliminate some of these middlemen entities that are administering? And you know, it's a it's a pretty cumbersome uh, project to administer all these rights, and therefore these companies, uh, ASCAPs and BMI performing rights organizations, and Harry Fox Agency, and digitally uh, through things called blockchain, and through what they call like smart contracts which has all the, you know, the writer information and the collaborators and how to get paid. So by connecting those dots uh, without these entities in between, that also will help drive up the songwriter royalties. And I think we'll continue to make it a more efficient marketplace. But, you know, getting back to the change in how the business has uh, gone over since I started in the industry in the 90s, to where it is now and how music is being distributed and consumed, it's, you know, it's much different. You know, we're not just talking from vinyl, you know, no pun intended, to cassette, CD, download, streaming. You know, when you get from downloading particularly to streaming, you know, you know, vinyl, you know, vinyl cassette, all those physical formats and even downloading kind of can be bundled similarly economically, but when you get into streaming, that's where things changed. Streaming has kind of disrupted the industry some bit. I mean, you would think that with those type of numbers that it would be a, a bigger payout. You know, when you get into YouTube plays, when you get into Spotify plays and Pandora's, you know, um, spins, etc., uh, the economics really are disrupted. Nowadays, you, there's no upfront purchase of $18 to buy a record. It's just like you pay a subscription to a company that you can play what you want and as much as you want. And every time you play it, a little bit of money has to go. If you were to get the same economics as the other paradigm um, of physical records, let's say, um, obviously couldn't sustain itself.
where's that sweet spot between how we consume music today versus how we consumed music by that purchase. And so right now, you know, if you bought a Bob Dylan album in the you know, 60s or 70s or whatever it might be, um, you know, or Michael Jackson record, you know, that was it. You can play it out and, and there's no more royalties to be earned. But fast forward, if that was a digital age of streaming, you're still paying every time you play it. So it's just totally different paradigm. The money that's gonna be earned isn't right now, it's potentially 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years from now. So there's gonna be like micro pennies along the way. So, I mean, until the day where things start to look up, you know, cause, because at this point right now, you know, an artist can't survive on just waiting for these micro dollars to come in from streaming. You know, what would you suggest that, you know, in the meantime, you know, before, you know until this, this, this paradigm switches, you know, what do you think artists should be doing to kind of better their brand and just better their craft and making financial strides within the industry? Well, that's a good question. A lot of times these days, artists are DIY artists. They're do-it-yourself. They're gonna be distributing it themselves. And, you know, you mentioned brand. And I think branding an artist these days, you know, the artist can sell other things besides music. They can perform live, which earns a revenue. They can license the song to uh, a television show, an advertisement, a film that hopefully will generate some revenue. They can create merchandise around their brand that might earn some money. You have to be pretty savvy, you know? You gotta be an entrepreneur. You have to, what's your forte as an artist? How can you maximize your earnings based on what you can do? Sometimes that means working maybe within the industry, outside the industry to help finance what you're doing in the industry and from just trying to expand into different creative areas whether it be acting sponsorships endorsements things along those lines so you know i think artists these days have to look at their career a little bit more holistically so fast forwarding time you uh founded your own law your own firm uh Heyman law um, what was like the inspiration, like the motivation for you to want to just now have something of your own? Maybe a combination of a couple things. Um, at Polygram, eventually when they merged with Universal, I got laid off, the job moved to LA. I just thought, well, if I'm gonna do my own thing, maybe I should do it while I'm single, young. And so I felt like it was a less of a risk and I didn't want to have a shoulda, woulda, coulda retrospective look at my career. No, very. Anybody can, you know, have the idea to found a, a business or, you know, but it takes, you know, ingredients of passion, network, um, funding, personal capital. I mean, walk me through the beginning stage of you building, building, excuse me, aim and law. Like, what was the, uh, what was that process like? What was that, uh, what was the, the, the struggle like trying to build it to the success that it's having now? Definitely a lot of figuring out, struggle, good work. Uh, along the way, I've had um, great mentors to help guide me through the process of establishing a firm. And, you know, it slowly builds like a snowball. And then one thing leads to another, to another. And I got more comfortable with networking, and then I wanted to create my own networking um, event. Where I was like, well, I have this cool client, and they could utilize the services of this photographer, or, you know, et cetera. And I started creating my own networking events. And I just thought, like, trying to help people and bring them together. And eventually, it would maybe circle back around to me to do more legal or for them to consider me. So, you know, I started a, a networking event called Toasted Almonds. Uh, it's been on for like six or seven years, and so that's another platform. You know, just like anyone else, you know, you have to have a platform to market and promote what you do as a creative, as a lawyer, etc. So, so Heyman Law has 
helped and contribute and gave like expert advice to clients such as uh, journalists and personality hosts and producer Sharon L. Carpenter, um, Brooklyn born Grammy award winning Maya Zuzena, um, recording artist and love and hip hop star uh, Bridget Kelly. You know, the cool thing about um, having this under your belt, you know, you have the opportunity to connect and build these relationships with these, um, these clients. And sometimes it goes beyond just the business aspect of it. And one person in uh, particular that, um, that you were allowed to like, I guess, build this relationship with was a recording artist, uh, Grammy nominated uh, businessman philanthropist, uh, Aloe Black. Hmm. How did, um, how did all that develop? So, you know, with, with Aloe, that was an interest, you know, we met through uh, a, a law school student, a mutual friend, uh, you know, a friend of his, uh, a mutual friend. He was based out of California, but he studied law here. And he said, hey, I have an artist uh, that's coming to New York. I think he might need help with a record deal. And uh, we developed a rapport and uh, developed a good relationship with, with, um, with Aloe. And, uh, the opportunity to sign with Stones Throw Records presented itself. He was up in the air, should I, should I wait, should I go to a major? And I said, you know, maybe you should go with Stones Throw, you know? Um, a bit of a stepping stone, you know, uh, to the maybe a major label. You don't want to just maybe start there and then there's really no foundational uh, fan base. And so we developed a good rapport because we would travel to different conferences and festivals and you know it's a, a grind you know and he's and he's still out there doing his thing you know I've been fortunate to be able to provide advice and nurture relationships with these folks and you know I enjoy it. Barry you know often with you know emerging artists you know they fall into just really focusing on just their craft and they often forget about like the legal aspect of things, you know. And I think with, um, you know, Heyman Law, I think one of the things that you guys practice is uh, intellectual property. You know, I think this is like the core, I guess the foundation for artists to have more of an understanding and kind of navigate their way through the industry, you know. But, you know, for ones that are like not familiar with um, intellectual property, I mean, what areas does, does it cover? Intellectual property is the broad category of these creations of the mind. You know, as an artist, you're kind of doing different areas to try to, you know, build upon, you know, you know, you're, you know promote and market yourself. So you're going to be doing different things: songs, recordings, creative works in general. You have things that are not tangible, like songs and. Um, books and you know, even choreography, those are copyrights. And those are one of the areas within intellectual property. One of the things that creatives and businesses that I work with uh, need to also consider is protecting their name, their logo, their slogan. That is also part of intellectual property. So I work with clients and working with co-counsel to protect that area. So Barry, where do you see just the industry moving towards in the next five years? What I see a lot of are talent coming to me, trying to say, well, there's a lot of options, maybe overwhelming amount of options. On the one hand, it's great that there's these options to marketing companies, distribution companies, companies that have a heart and a soul to them and want to treat the artist fairly, companies that are trying to um, get rid of the middleman and do those blockchain and, you know, and go direct. Um, I think there's going to be a, a lot of options out there for the talent. From an artist's perspective, you know, whether they need to work with a major label, I think has also changed. You know, the barrier of entry historically was really high. My first internship was trying to get records in mom and pop shops across the country. Um, recording costs were extremely high. 
you know, productions were hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nowadays, you can produce a hit song, you know, for a lot less in a bedroom. I think the hit song right now around the world is exactly that, with no major company behind them. And so the barrier of entry, the cost of production are down, the options are out there. You can go direct to consumer right through YouTube, through all these different platforms that allow you to do that. I mean, and then there's companies that will assist, you know, assist along the way. So I, I think that these companies will continue to uh, evolve and grow and record labels are going to be maybe more like publishers or management companies. Management companies are going to start doing recording type things and they're all kind of merging into like these multi-dimensional, they can do it all because at the end of the day, cost of production distribution is a lot easier. So, you know, it can help complement the service. If you're managing an artist, then why go to a record company to go to put it out there if you could pay 20 grand and own the rights, you know, to it, the copyright we were talking about, and that deal is struck typically between the record company and the talent. Um, they might want to retain that ownership. Sometimes you don't want to retain it because you retain 100% ownership and then you get 100% of zero money. Sometimes it's okay to give up copyright. Sometimes it's okay to give up half of it. Sometimes it's you relying upon money that you just don't have. And sometimes you need assistance to help navigate. So I think for each individual talent, um, it's a different answer. So I think that's what you're, there's going to continue to be a learning. Uh, of what really is out there, what are the options for that talent and to help navigate it, you know, and that's through education, kind of like what we're doing now. <laughs> so Barry, when it's, you know, all said and done and you make your imprint, you know, on this world, you know, what do you want people to remember you for? I like for people to be able to accomplish their goals and if I can help facilitate that, you know, you know, that's, that, that means a lot to me. If I can help bring along the next student to be educated, to not being taken advantage of, and hearing the horror stories that you do hear of, and that they can enter into a contract and business negotiation, light bulb should hopefully go off for them to know what they need to take that next step and to feel good about what they're about to endeavor into. Well, Barry, you said it best. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
It's like his phone just don't exist. You know that he won't call you. Ooh, 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 ooh